Welcome to this afternoon's webinar on the art of Anglican preaching. This event is offered by the SEEP Network and brings together five brilliant panelists I am very eager to hear from. And I'll introduce them in just a moment, but first, our topic. Among the gifts of the Anglican tradition is a distinctive legacy of preaching. What's special about it? What can we draw from it today? Now, this webinar has also been advertised as the lost art of Anglican preaching. So we also want to know whether the role of preaching has changed in some way. Do our present circumstances call for some kind of re-examination of it? So I hope that we can leave this conversation today encouraged about the ministry of preaching and inspired by history and inspired by each other and equipped with a few more resources. <clears throat> so let's start by introducing our panel. Um, I am Abigail Woolley Cutter, and I am a doctoral candidate at, in Christian Ethics at Southern Methodist University. I host podcasts and other events from time to time, and I am delighted to be facilitating this conversation. We have also the Reverend Dr. Andrew McGowan. He is the Dean and President of Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. He is also a Professor of Anglican Studies and Pastoral Theology. So thanks for being with us. We have also the Reverend Dr. Christine Blakes. She is the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Thank you. We have the Reverend Mark Michael, who is rector of St. Francis Episcopal Church in Potomac, Maryland, and editor of Living Church. We have the Reverend Kino Vite, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal in Brooklyn, New York, and the Reverend Dr. Cal Lane, who is Associate Rector of St. George's Episcopal Church in Dayton, Ohio, as well as a uh, Affiliate Professor of Church History at Neshota House Seminary and Associate Editor of The Living Word, which is a preaching resource we'll hear a little bit more about. Um, now, in addition to what I have shared briefly in these intros, these panelists have an impressive collection of ministry experience and scholarship and skills and interests and service around the globe, all of which I know inform their perspective on preaching. So <clears throat> besides all this, they've all agreed to be involved in one way or another with uh, the new preaching resource, The Living Word, which we'll hear about. Um, now, I'd like to start by hearing from the panelists, why do you think it's important to re-examine preaching in the church right now? You can take that all kind of directions, but what is it about this moment that makes it important to have this conversation? Well, uh, I would say that for one, um, uh, now attending church is almost like listening to the radio, you know, to some degree, you cannot be in church to participate. And although there is some visuals on television, but it's like listening to the old BBC somewhat. And so um, if people are listening uh, more than participating, then, then what you say must be quite impactful. Um, it must be quite stimulating. More so, um, we are, th th there was a time when we, we would think that the economy or technology would solve any problem whatsoever, right? So whatever comes our way, uh, our, our great uh, market economy and the technology available to us would solve those problems. So we, we lived in an age of sort of certainty. And now with COVID, uh, all of a sudden, the certainty is gone. And, and even though there is you know, a, a vaccine, there is still a whole host of uh, a sort of a feeling of anxiety, a feeling, a feeling of uncertainty. And, and preaching, I think, is, is, is a way to remind people that there's still one thing that's certain and it's God, right? Although things feel chaotic, there is still a God of order. And hence, in my mind, it's quite important at a time such as this. Yeah. Thank you. Who else? Well, that, it's, that was a great answer, I think. And perhaps the, you know, the closing line deserves to be repeated that the, the reason preaching is important at any time is because of the good news. And um, you know, I think one of the things we, we need to assert uh, about Anglican preaching and preaching in general is that it's fundamentally a proclamation of the gospel. I think that uh, as uh, Father Kino said, you know, these, these interesting recent times have, uh, have, have taught us things about preaching as well as other things. I think he's right that the sort of the narrow bandwidth of our 
recent experience of what we're still calling worship, you know, online has emphasized the, the visual to some extent and certainly the oral. I, I, I was taken by his characterization of that as being sort of like the Beeb of old, because in fact, isn't it interesting that the visual part of this is often a very mixed bag. You know, how often do we want to turn our screens off or turn our slides off so that we can actually deal with the oral part more than the visual? So I guess that while I don't think the pandemic's been good for preaching any more than it's been good for anything else, it has taught us some things. And it has taught us, as he said, of, of the need for good news, but it's also put a kind of focus on the spoken word that has been sort of unflinching uh, mm -hmm. and, and therefore, that even if um, even if it's not good for preaching, it has revealed in clearer terms the importance of preaching, shall we say. So this is a moment, I think, to, to ask ourselves about what's fundamental, what's core to the whole exercise. And if and when, by uh, the grace of God, we're able to be in a, a, a different position in, in coming months, uh, I hope that we will emerge with a, with a renewed and refreshed sense of the importance of, of proclaiming, uh, proclaiming the word. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sometimes I think um, we we put a lot of emphasis on ours as a tradition with liturgy at the center. Pastoral care is is important, and um, we have sometimes tended to cede the preaching to uh, the leaders in other denominations. And you know, it's just not possible to do liturgy and pastoral care in the same way. If if your Sunday morning was basically just a coffee hour in uh, vestments, uh, you're kind of left really stranded at the moment and you need to have something to say. And uh, this moment has put all that in focus in a new way with all this chaos happening. People need to hear a distinct and clear word from God. And uh, I don't know how you would, the rest of you would characterize it, but even though it's been a real headache to deal with all this technological stuff that doesn't always go right, my goodness, there's been so much to say um, and um, so many opportunities to speak right into the situations. And uh, the Sunday readings have often been an enormous gift in these particular times. Our people are not so much different today than they've always been um, in that they still crave to hear the word of life, that they still crave to be connected to Jesus, that they still crave to have the Holy Spirit enter their lives. And I think our people don't know how to do that probably any more or any less than people of any time and place. And yet the, the need is so desperate today that our preaching is somehow setting the table for people to meet Jesus again, meet Jesus for the first time, um, have the Holy Spirit speak afresh each Sunday, day by day. I wonder if I could uh, actually build a little bit on something that Andrew was talking about proclaiming the gospel, the idea that when we step into the pulpit, when we are opening the word, we are, we're proclaiming something that speaks to the moment. And there's a tension, I think, uh, particularly in a, in a convulsive age, you know, whether we're talking about the pandemic or, or politics or any, just our societal woes all around, there's a temptation to say, I'm going to speak to the situation. And what we, the, the, the temptation is, I'm going to set aside the text that's before me. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a plea, actually, that our preaching is also consistently, consistently exegetical, that we have an obligation as stewards of the word to um, speak to the text that was just read. I mean, we believe that the text being read aloud in worship has dynamic power, that the Holy Spirit pierces the heart. And that's why we're all not just sitting down and, and reading the insert quietly, and then someone's going to unpack it for us. Rather, we believe in proclaiming the text of scripture, and then we've ordained someone to stand up and offer a word about it. And if we believe that, that God's word does speak to an inbreaking kingdom, and we have confidence in that, um, then I think no matter how desperate the situation is, we have an obligation to say, now hear from God's word. Um, hear what God's word has to say to this moment. Um, a sort of secondhand anecdote, my wife, when she was in seminary uh, during 
and right across the street from the CDC in Atlanta, um, they went to chapel. And indeed, uh, they thought that the preacher is going to just speak about the situation. And the preacher said, I have a text before me, and I'm going to speak about this text. And through that, he was able, this faculty member at Candler was able to say something about, about the, the fear and the anxiety, but he understood his primary obligation as opening up the text itself for God's people. So that, that's what I would say. It, this is our time to, to dig even deeper into the word of God. Thank you all. I'm feeling a little inspired already, even though I don't even preach very often. Um, but um, I wanted to say to all of our attendees that um, I want to encourage you to be adding your questions to the chat feature um, within Zoom here. And uh, we will make sure to reserve some time toward the end of our discussion here to address those. Um, we can, we'll wrap up shortly after uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern, um, maybe 4.15 uh, or so, but we'll make sure not to go past that. Um, and toward that time, we will be sure to uh, take a look at the questions that you have contributed in the chat feature. Thanks a lot. Um, so back to the panelists, before we turn to problem solving or discussing what resources we can draw on, I would like to hear from each of you what has preaching meant in your own spiritual lives? How has God used that for your formation? Hmm. Well, I go, okay, go ahead, Vina. Go ahead. I grew up in the ELCA in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, where the tre pre preaching tradition is law and gospel. It's it's heavily doctrinal, which. Um, a great gift in formation and then when I went to seminary the tradition that I was trained up in was um, I think really strong saying instead of talking about Jesus as you preach how do you do Jesus to people how do you do salvation to people um, and so I was ordained in the ELCA and when we came into the Episcopal Church a number of years ago the real gift of Anglican preaching was this idea that our, our hearts and our spirits get tied into our minds. So preaching becomes not just an intellectual task, but something that, that tills our spirits, that brings in the charismatic gifts of the Anglican tradition, that brings in the, the beauty of the language and the rhetoric, so that it's, it's really a, a whole person process of preparing a sermon, of giving a sermon, of receiving a sermon. Um, and so it just feels so good to have a good Anglican sermon come at me. I, uh, I want to piggyback on that when you, you say that it's sort of preaching goes deep, right? And um, when I left seminary and I began working as a deacon, I also taught at a day school and so I would be at the day school much of the week and then and on weekends would tend to the business of service at the church. And I realized that there was no block of 20 hours where I could sit down, and focus on the sermon. And I thought, Lord, how am I going to do this? And I was inspired to read the text, say Monday, and just sort of read, mark, inwardly digest, just read the text and chew on it all week, you know, um, sort of the, the medieval, you know, reading, meditation, praying, and, you know, what do you want me to say? And, 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 and essentially, you do that all week, and you're not sure when it will happen, but at some point in time, there's a breakthrough, there's sort of a revelation, there's sort of a, if you'd like, the moment described as contemplation, where God uses the word and pierces your heart, right? And that's what you then deliver on a Sunday, you know. Um, well, that, that, that's kind of what, how preaching has sort of uh, um, enhanced my formation, you know. You, you, you read, mark, digest, just chew on that word, pray on it, feed on it. Yeah. Mm. I, I, um, I would again, res resonate again, uh, with Kino there, I, um, I, I'm one of those child of the rectory people, sorry. So, you know, I, I grew up hearing a sermon every Sunday and uh, my own uh, father, now, now retired 
from from doing such things, I think was a very good preacher, which is a mixed blessing, you know, when it comes to how those things fit into one's own life. Um, but um, I think that uh, some on this webinar are people who for whom preaching is is something they do and others perhaps uh, something they hear more than do. But I would say that over the, over the course of evolving into my own Christian identity, that becoming a preacher has actually been fundamental to my own vocation as a Christian. And I don't mean to say that that's uh, something which is generally true because of course most of us don't preach most of the time but I do think that each of us has to live into whatever a vocation as a Christian is and um, I uh, sometimes the experience of wrestling with the text and uh, and I do f often feel that it's like um, you know Jacob wrestling with the angel it's not always a happy process you know uh, <laughs> you know what on earth is this going to say is this good news at all how do i make sense of this that this process is not only uh something that i hope occasionally bears fruit or glimpses of light for those to whom i preach but it's necessarily something which is absolutely formative for me now that, that could become somewhat self-indulgent i i readily um admit but i think that for me you know be, being able to preach on a regular basis has become something which is um yeah, and this is an interesting pandemic observation too, by the way, being able to preach regularly is something which is at least as formative for me about living into my priestly and Christian vocation as being able to preside sacramental worship. Um, and that's perhaps been another insight of these, of these recent times. But I think that unless we understand that it's our own wrestling and engagement with this extraordinary possibility that the word of God is present in the text, even if that doesn't mean simply, you know, expounding it in a jejun sort of, in a way, but rather through through whatever the difficulties that it raises for us, these glimpses of light, these awkward, sharp, piercing moments, that this is fundamental to who we are, not simply the question of imparting information, but it's it's about being ourselves before and, and with the people of God, if, if we're preachers, I think, in, in whatever order we are as we preach. I would say that for me, my... Um my faith has grew a tremendous amount through hearing thoughtful sermons as a young person. I grew up in a reformed church where preaching was important and we had a, our minister for a long time who was a very gifted storyteller. And then when I went off to college, I went to Duke and Will Williman was the Dean of the chapel. And if you know Will, he has a very distinctive and care, you know, just, just has a real, very funny and had a really powerful way of speaking that I found really compelling as a, a young person thinking about the ministry. And when I went off to seminary at Oxford, um, a lot of my time was spent going to sermons. <laughs> I bet many Sundays I'd go to, you know, he had heard three sermons and uh, people from all sorts of places coming and I, you know, hearing different styles and people integrating historical insight and theological study. And, and so um, since then I've continued to, I read a lot of sermons um, just as a, a, for my own devotional practice. Uh, I'm a Victorian sermon reader, though I like the Caroline Divines as well, but I find that um, in places, you know, sort of parts of our tradition that have that really dig deeply into the, the, the scriptures and see these connections and, um, I, I still love purple prose. I know that that's not supposed to be popular these days, but it does work on occasion and it, it moves my heart. Um, and uh, I, like Andrew said, I, I'm really grateful to have the gift to, to have a word to say. You know, so many times, I don't know how it is for you, but when somebody you love uh, gets married or baptizes a child or is buried you know to, this is the gift that you, i'm often asked to offer is to come and preach and this is kind of the thing i can do and the way that i process my joy or sorrow or gratitude um, by sharing what god has given uh, as a gift back to his people so it's uh, i do think it's very integral to this vocation Mark, very briefly, that reminds me of, a, you know, those of us that step into a pulpit on a regular basis sort of learn certain tricks to make sure that we, but it's not a trick, to identify with the people that are listening to us, you know, and, and, and one that I often 
pull back out is if I'm not saying this for anyone, but for me, fine. But I find that that is my being vulnerable, not only with my people, but with the word itself to mm-hmm. say that I, I don't think I'm alone on this, but if, if, if I'm the only one who's guilty of this particular uh, sin or, or whatever it is that, that I'm looking into and finding emerging from the word, if I'm the only one who needs to hear the sermon, so be it. But I don't ever think that that's actually what's going on. Um, but Mark, I, 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 I like very much the idea of, of, of pulling from these, these earlier voices so that we can enrich. By the way, I, I, you're familiar with the term sermon gadding, right? The, idea that the, the Puritans would run from pulpit to pulpit to pulpit to sermon gad, right? So I, I picture you as a sermon gadder. Right? I was, yeah. Well, so here we are to talk specifically about the Anglican tradition. Uh, So I want to hear, what do you find special about this legacy? And then, um, and then we can follow up with that. First, focus on what is unique about it? What do we have in our in our storehouse. Um, and then uh, in what ways have um, certain particulars perhaps been lost or in some ways gained? You know, what are the changing emphases within this tradition? And maybe I'll turn specifically um, to begin with um, to Cal, who is our um, historian. Sure. Uh, well, I guess I would simply highlight that well, two things. One, it's become sort of a commonplace when we think about the Anglican tradition broadly, and I'm sure there's there's others on this panel that can speak in a far more erudite way than I can on this, but it's become a commonplace to say that that Anglicanism itself is is provisional, right, for whatever that means. We think of Archbishop Fisher saying, you know, we have no doctrine of our own, right? Um, I think there is something about that to Anglican preaching. So we're, 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 we're here vaunting Anglican preaching, right? And yes, if we compare it to say, as, as Christine wonderfully highlighted, the law gospel tradition of, of a good Lutheran sermon. Um, Anglicanism itself, though, is willing to borrow from other traditions. And that's, by the way, something, and I know we're going to get to this later, but, but that's something that's actually I'm very proud of with the Living Word Project, is that it's not a uniquely it's, it's not just Andrews and Dunn and Wesley and Whitfield. They're there, but so are a lot of other folks. And that's true of our, of our pulpit work. You know, in, in the Anglican tradition, we are willing to draw on others because we understand ourselves to be part of the church Catholic. Uh, and I think that's true of the tradition broadly. And I think it's true of Anglican preaching, especially. The second thing I would say, though, that, that is... Um, I, I, I am proud of with this tradition is, and I, sometimes I worry I take it for granted, um, that we, in our preaching, are truly Catholic and Reformed uh, in the sense that we have, as I said earlier, a commitment to exegesis. We have a commitment, a Reformed, uh, com- I'll even use the word evangelical uh, in its classic sense, commitment to opening up the text Right. But at the same time, we do this in the context of worship. It's not simply Bible study. It's not that we we get through this part of the liturgy and stop and then we have a Bible study. Right. Uh, But rather, we do this as part of our worship, as as intrinsic to worship. And it's also within the context of the rhythm of the Christian year, one that is common uh, with other uh, congregations, not just just locally here in in our place. So we're doing this in this 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 act of preaching, this act of biblical engagement in the rhythm of the Christian year, which I which I hope and pray makes us, uh, uh, or at least allows us to claim a Catholicity. So I think that that's something that that brings both the the best of the Reformed tradition and the best of the Catholic tradition together. And I and I would I would argue that that's the genius of Anglican preaching is that we're able to be both Reformed and Catholic. Um, I thought that was great, and I think that we could say that backwards and forwards a few times and, and learn much from it, that nexus of the Reformed Catholic. Um, it's, it's worth pondering that the most famous Anglican preacher of 2021, see, I, I almost forgot, um, uh, is probably Michael Curry. Mm. And, um, you know, he, of course, 
doesn't sound especially like Lancelot Andrews, if you've noticed, uh, some of you will have. Um, and uh, I, th I think it's a great example in, in, in certain ways that to show the breadth uh, and depth of Anglican preaching, because, you know, it's not just that the fact that he's presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church means that no one's going to dare to say that he's an Anglican. It just is Anglican, because, of course, Anglicanism has a variety of expressions. And his, uh, his sort of black church sort of uh, culture and demeanor reminds us that there are multiple dimensions here. The Reformed and Catholic uh, Paul being one, as Cal said, but there's also, of course, the different cultural expressions of Anglicanism. There are people on this uh, chat I see who, you know, from Namibia and from Australia, even uh, in, in this sort of conversation, sort of somewhat focused on the, the Episcopal Church, which reminds us that what probably counts as normal preaching in different parts of the communion will be marked by very different canons and, and assumptions. And I think we should celebrate and rejoice in that. That doesn't mean that there aren't certain places on that graph, if I can go back to, you know, treating Cal's comment as like one axis, you know, that there, there are probably two other axes here, at least, aren't there? You know, about, um, for instance, we, we put a lot of emphasis in the Episcopal Church on the liturgical preaching that goes with the three-year cycle of the lectionary and the celebration of the Eucharist as the, as the primary form of our gathering. And that has brought us great riches. It has that inherent hermeneutic of, of the center of the gospel of Christ as, as the center of the liturgy, which we ritualize in the gospel and so forth. Um, but there are losses, not, not so much through the fact of that, as through the fact that we become a bit one dimensional on that, in that particular aspect, shall we say, that, um, you know, that the, the older Anglican caricature of, you know, three points and a quote from T.S. Eliot, you know, is, is now, um, you know, two points and a quote from Mary Oliver or something like that, because of course you don't have time for the third point, do you? You know, because everyone wants to be out in an hour and 15 minutes or whatever it is. We, there is something that we had in, in context such as um, Evensong, for instance, you know, I'm mm -hmm. one person on, on the presentation panel is probably old enough to remember before the wonderful world of Disney killed Evensong, you know, on Sunday nights, um, that, um, that there was a, a tradition of expository and intellectual preaching even in some parish context, but certainly in cathedral and collegiate preaching, which is harder to find now because mm -hmm. our, the strength of emphasis we placed upon pastoral liturgical preaching has weighted things down that end of the spectrum a bit. And um, I, I want not in any way to lament the, the things that are flourishing about Anglican preaching so much as to say that just as I'm sure that if we paid attention to the cultural and geographical diversity of, commun of communion, we'd see quite different things popping up as, as the, the, the flavor. So too, there are things that we could afford to, to you know, recall and refresh a little. And perhaps that may have to do partly with, you know, what, what Mark is, is still celebrating about Victorian preaching. But I, I don't think there's anything for us to be ashamed of in the more cerebral elements about Anglican preaching, including if, if I dare say so. I mean, I know apologetics is a dirty word in some quarters, the, the lowest form of theology, who said that? But, you know, there, there is that case for that kind of intelligent Anglican preaching, which is prepared to meet scepticism, not simply uh, with competing assertions, but rather coaxing its way around the possibility of seeing past the obvious. I mean, think of Ron Williams in this regard. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron Williams is, is a great Anglican preacher in that sort of mode to me, even when he's not preaching, because a lot of his actual other, other work actually has a kind of homiletic and spiritual reflective character to it as well. So there are things I'd like to hear more of in Anglican preaching, which is sometimes perhaps being constrained by the circumstances of the ways in which we currently do liturgy and mission. I'd, I'd love to see, you know, one of the things that come out of the pandemic being a way to say, how can we remember, going back to Father Kino's point before, how can we remember the ways we learned to listen again more clearly mm -hmm. to the spoken word and to emphasize that in what we're going to have of our life going forward? No, that's very helpful. I, I, I sympathize very deeply with what you're saying, Andrew. It, one of the things that's been striking as we've been doing some research for the Living Word Project is, you know, going back and looking at the length of sermons that were published uh, even just 50 years ago or much less. Uh, we had a project for a while of the Living Word where we would make a podcast episode out of an excerpt from a sermon and um, they, the people doing the video ed or audio editing only wanted them to be 20 minutes long. Boy, you try to excerpt 20 minutes out of a John Donne sermon, and mm -hmm. a, a thing must have taken an hour and 45 to preach. Um, so, the, you know, there's just a um, few points can't be unfolded in as comprehensive a way. Um, there are um, nuances and connections that have to be placed to the side. 
And I think that often what's lost is the connection of this particular text we're looking at in the whole sweep of the biblical narrative, which really helps us to uh, uh, mark God's consistent work and to help people understand the scriptures as a united gift from him uh, as a form of revelation. I think there's much more of that in some of our older material. I also think that a lot of Anglican preaching, especially in the Caroline period, um, um, uh, has a kind of poetic character to it. It does take uh, words very seriously. I, I just finished a, a, a history of preaching um, by a Presbyterian who doesn't much like Anglican preaching and his complaint is that it's always so flowery that it goes over people's heads. But um, I think that uh, a gift of that is helping people to stop and take individual words more deliberately to kind of ponder and, and cherish. Um, and that sometimes that can be lost um, when we're going so quickly to the application or, you know, when we're really just sketching historical background. Um, and um, I think our tradition has often tried to use language skillfully and to speak to that broader theological narrative. Um, and I do think there's room for more of a recovery of that in the way preaching is done today in our church. Can I offer just an historical writer to what Mark has shared? The, the history of, 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 of our ability to, um, to follow and to digest a sermon as a listener. It, there's been a lot of analysis of that. There's an enormous difference between reading a text that has been published, that has been cleaned up, that has been you know, vetted uh, and then released than the act of preaching. I'm sure many of us have been asked for, can I see a copy of your sermon? To which the right answer, if I may be pedantic, is you heard the sermon. You want a manuscript. That's not the same thing as the, preaching is a performative act, right? It's not simply just reading a text. And so when we look back at something like a Dunn sermon, and yes, it may have been, there's this wonderful project on Paul's cross sermons uh, in London in, in the 17th century to see, to see if you were, how far away you could be and still hear it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you could actually follow what was being said for an hour and a half of sometimes breaking down a, a Latin word into its nth degree, you know, in the Aunt Latin, mm -hmm. Lancelot Andrews style, right? Um, but I, I do want to qualify that reading a text is, you know, the text of a sermon is different from the performative act of preaching. Um, Luther, there's, there's this brilliant comment that um, uh, Luther, when his postals, when his postals came out, uh, the first set uh, were, were highly edited uh, by, the, by, the, by the note taker, uh, so much so that it sort of made Luther upset, right? The, the, the second round by Kaspar Krusiger was much cleaner and neater, but on the whole, the first round was probably closer to what Luther said. Hmm. Second round was closer to what Luther meant. That's, that's the, the, the current sort of analysis that like, well, we, we need the, we need the good doctor cleaned up, you know, so it can become a text. So again, hmm. just highlighting that difference between reading the text of a sermon and the actual performative act, right. That you're standing in God's people in the midst of God's people in the context of worship. Well, there's, a, there's also a, a great temptation to want to compete as a preacher with the many voices that are out there, or even preachers of old. And mm -hmm. I find that uh, God's would tend to be seasonal, meaning that God's word has a way of speaking uh, to a specific era and a specific time. And um, uh, uh, sometimes in order to compete with the many voices, you know, to, to sound like you know, and there are many voices, historians, intellectuals, what have you, uh, a lot of rhetoric comes out. Uh, uh, but, you know, with Anglican preaching, you're not called to compete with the many voices. When you're called to, to um, uh, speak to the text or rather allow the text to speak through you, which is why you really allowing the text to speak through you. But, but one thing I think uh, that, that, that besides the different styles that there may be for preaching and and, and what have you, I think there is there is a, 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 a history within Anglicanism to use poetry or metaphors. 
And I think that that is probably one of the most powerful ways, whichever, um, um, whether it be expository, whether it be looking at your text, whether it be you jumping and running in the aisle, but, but the use of metaphors or poetry, I think is something that cannot be lost in, in, in sort of um, um, gathering people's attention, but more so saying what cannot always be said um, by, by the words of man, right? You know, the way that, that's a way in which the text could speak through us. Mm -hmm. you know? I think a real gift of Anglican preaching is that we get to bring all these streams together. As you all have said, you know, we've got the, the strong scriptural tradition. We believe that the scripture is strong enough to hold the events of the day and to speak meaningfully to it and to save our lives in the midst of it. We believe that our doctrine is strong enough to support a community of faith. We believe that the Holy Spirit through the charismatic parts of our church is alive and active among us. We believe that the language that we've developed in our tradition is powerful to open us up through metaphor and image. And we, we treasure the, the global component of our communion. I've been listening to you all and thinking of the Nigerian church, you know, the two questions that they ask, I'm paraphrasing this, but who is Jesus and how is Jesus transforming us? Hmm. And that's an enormous gift that we get from our brothers and sisters in Nigeria to help help strengthen our preaching. Thank you all, I love these insights. Uh, now, we promised people we would talk a little bit about, um, about what is going really well. Where do you hear, what are your favorite um, sermons you've heard recently or we can extend recently to be you know the medium term i know a lot of a lot of regular preachers don't get to hear other preachers all that often um but um but share a little bit about uh what sermon you've heard has been very successful and why in what way we could say in particular in what way does it honor the legacy of anglican preaching I want to mention one, if, if I may. I, I have to say, I'm, I've, so I'm surrounded by an embarrassment of riches where I am. I've got two wonderful faculty colleagues, both of whom connect with the Episcopal Church here at Yale and Carolyn Sharp and Danielle McRae, and, and a student body who are surprisingly good preachers in, in the eyes of some. We had a, I have a resident bishop at the moment, you know, resident virtually, who after a couple of weeks of morning prayer, listening to student preachers every couple of days, just sort of said, wow, you know, these people are blowing... Um, people out of the water. And I, I say that as a word of hope, because I'm sure it's true in many other seminary contexts as well, that we have wonderful young preachers being formed in theological education. So I'm spoiled. Um, but we made an effort this semester to, uh, you know, again, make a virtue out of necessity with the pandemic and invite a wider range of preachers into our virtual chapel because we could. And so we had preachers from the UK and from South Africa and from the West Coast getting up at four in the morning or whatever it was to, to be with us, God bless them. Um, and one I'm just going to mention was uh, Patrick Cheng, who uh, is at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue, among other places. And Patrick, I, I remember speaking in particular about wisdom. And in fact, um, his, his sermon could have been a bit of a meta narrative upon the, the topic today because it was uh, one of the passages I remember was from Ecclesiasticus at least and at about you know the wisdom itself and the character of wisdom and you know Patrick is someone whose academic work as a systematic theologian as some of you will know who was on the faculty at EDS in the past you know has uh, has a lot to say about uh, Asian American biblical hermeneutics uh, and uh, about queer uh, hermeneutics and interpretation as well and yet it was the most profoundly thoughtfully Anglican piece of homiletics in the kinds of ways we've been talking about you know in, in between the cracks of this conversation one of the most very cap most capital a uh, Anglican sermons I've heard without in any way being constrained to that fact it was a very thoughtful reflection about the nature of wisdom and the nature of God and um, it was just for me a, a, an, in, an embodiment of the way in which the the, the ways we want to stand on and re refresh and celebrate uh, some of the things we value most about the tradition need not be in a sort of zero-sum game war 
with some of the other things that are coming towards us in the changing world of hermeneutics and the, and the culturally diverse reality of a church that will have to be more culturally diverse to have a future at all. And uh, so I, I want to sort of t tell those who are trying to negotiate those questions as preachers or as schedule as a preaching or whatever it is, be, be of good cheer, be of good heart. Um, there, there, are, there are yet more riches to, to break forth from the word. And some of the things which may seem a little different and new uh, to us may yet have the capacity to draw upon and to, to hold up what we value most about the tradition as well. So um, a shout out to, to, to Patrick Cheng for, 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 for a moment of revelation for me this past semester. I would say that uh, I have the the gift of serving with a um, a very talented Lutheran preacher who happens to be my wife, um, who assists in our parish. But um, she, uh, her academic work, she's she's writing a dissertation about a medieval preaching and biblical commentary. So she's she's uh, has this talent for kind of digging very deeply into particular words in the style of the of the kinds of people that she's studying. And she preached on Sunday, of course, you know, a, a, a day when there was a lot you could talk about in the sermon um, and really focused on um, the deep meaning of repentance um, as in, in the repentance to which John the Baptist was announcing on the shore of the Jordan and, and asking us, you know, what as a nation, we're, what repentance is needed for us as individuals and as a nation and how the path forward is through humility and um, it was just a sermon that brought together so many themes and and it but it was held it had its unity in returning again and again to that one key text and then kind of allowing that central focus to illuminate all other sections and it really that to me that's um she doesn't read hardly any Anglican material, but but uh, this this is at the heart of what I have valued so much about the, this particular tr preaching tradition over the years. You know, when we when we first start out as preachers, we think I've only got one thing I can say about this text, so I better worry if I say it this year, I won't have anything to say in three years. But she's a great model of saying, well, you can just talk about this one little piece of it and you'll have more than enough to talk about, say all that needs to be said. And there'll be plenty of material to come back to next time the, you, the text comes around to us. So that's, that was my great sermon recently. I'm also really fortunate to get to preach alongside a great preacher. My associate rector at St. Paul's, Michael Whitna, is a fine preacher. And he got the privilege of preaching on Christmas two this year, the, the slaughter of the holy innocents. And we decided that, you know, the lectionary leaves the, the actual slaughter out, but we included it because if the Christian story can't grapple with with the slaughter of innocents, you know, is the Christian faith strong enough? No. So Michael preached on the holy innocents. Um, I saw a question. You can access this sermon at the St. Paul's website, St. Paul's Murfreesboro.org. Um, just click on the sermon section. And this is the sermon called, um, I think it's called Merry Christmas or Not. It's the January 4th sermon. And um, Michael tackled the, the, the problem of evil. You can tell he's been reading Fleming Rutledge mm. throughout Advent. Um, and he went right after it, talked about how Matthew's response to the problem of evil is not to offer up some uh, sentimental kind of there, there, it'll all get better kind of answer, but he enters us right into the lament of Isaiah. And lament is powerful because it tells the truth. And once we have truth on our hands, there's the opportunity for new birth to come. And we see this in Jesus' life as he spends that time in Egypt. And then there's the new exodus. But this exodus is different than the first exodus because it's not just the people of God, God's chosen people who are entering into the exodus. It is God incarnate among us who enters into the exodus. 
And so we're all brought into this new life, um, even when the holy innocents around us are, are under attack and being slaughtered. Let's dive into some specifics. I want to know now, um, as many of our attendees do, what resources do you specifically draw on when you are preparing your sermon? Christine, let's go right back to you. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, you know, we are so fortunate to have this new resource coming out of the Living Church with great contemporary sermons, historic sermons, and we'll we'll talk more about this in a little bit. But I wanted to be sure to share about a practice that's been really life-giving to me and my preaching for the past 10 years. Every weekday at 10 a.m., I've gotten together with whatever clergy happened to be my team. And if it's been a time in my life when I haven't had team, I beg and borrow team. So these days we're getting together on Zoom, um, 10 o'clock every weekday morning. And we do a Lectio Divino and prayer for an hour on the lectionary texts. So it's an engagement with colleagues, with trusted colleagues about how is this scripture touching me today? How is it touching down into my life? What is God stirring up? And what might be, what might be some other resources? Most of my best ideas and turns of phrase come from colleagues who've been reading things that I'm not reading or thinking about things I'm not thinking. And it seems like five hours a week would be an unmanageable um, commitment for that kind of Bible study and prayer together with colleagues. But when you put that block in, all the other work of the week falls around it. And I think it's powerful, not just for preaching, but for the congregations I've served, it's undoubtedly the, the spiritual heart and the engine of the, the parish's spiritual life. I, I, I still do actually pick up, um, you know, biblical commentaries, you know, those ones that actually sort of talk about Greek and Hebrew texts and anchor Bible and um, think, think, things like that. I mean, that's part of that whole wrestling at the fort of the Jabbok thing for me, because the journey back from that stuff to actually something that makes sense and is good news is often a long journey. Um, but I think that it's a richer one when I do that. But the other thing I wanted to mention that I do a fair bit of is um, I do read patristic commentary as well. And, you know, this is something I'm interested in for other reasons. And so um, Berkeley students and graduates will, will know that, you know, I've often preached on the Psalms at the, at the office, for instance, partly because it's such a counterintuitive thing. Uh, and, and I also, you know, I'm prepared to defend reading the Psalms Christologically, uh, you know, as well as historically critically, so to speak. So there's a bigger set of questions there. But I, I think, for instance, that being very practical, I was uh, providence dictated that the Living Church of all people put into my inbox today a new offer on the um, the New City translation of the expositions on the Psalms from Augustine, as well as uh, of the uh, commentary the on the, the Gospel of John and um, and his sermons uh, de tempore and. Uh, if anyone's on the Living Church mailing list and saw those, it would really be worth having a look at those Augustinian Psalms commentaries. They're not really a, a, a commentary. They were cobbled together subsequently from his week in, week out commentaries on the Psalms. Now, some of it may sort of take us a, a, a bit beyond the, the, the other side of the river that we intend to go because, of course, his assumptions and contexts are different. But um, there are also those uh, interesting sort of catenae, those ancient Christian commentaries on scripture that some people will know that, you know, volume by volume on different works. And I think those are really uh, terrific, actually. But I say that not because, it, and someone will know, who know me will know this, not because I'm interested in avoiding the, 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 the completely different sort of hermeneutical move towards ancient context and original meaning, but rather because I think the, the richest hermeneutical context we can put together from a scholarly point of view is actually one that that incorporates all of those things into a process of thinking about how the church receives scripture and how the church struggles with scripture in its own way, different historical contexts. So um, I, I don't know if the same people on this webinar will think that reading, um, reading, you know, Harry Attridge on a letter to the Hebrews in the Hermeneia series is, is going to be attractive as, as the ones who think about, you know, reading Augustine uh, talking about uh, Hebrews. But um, I think both of those things are worth doing and, and I do still do them and I'm still here. So there you go. <laughs>
We're in the year of Mark. Dean, do you have a favorite Mark commentary? If I didn't say that it was Adela Collins's commentary, then I'd get into trouble here at Yale, of course, wouldn't I? But, <laughs> but let me also say, just for the Dukies around, that um, I, I did just, you know, after a long time, for some reason, I neglected to get this, the second volume of Joel Marcus's uh, anchor commentary on Mark. Mm -hmm. And I like, I like Joel's Mark stuff, actually, um, too. So I, I would... Uh, I'd, I'd be happy with either of those, but I certainly don't mean those things uh, exclusively. Um, another set of commentaries for the, the more sort of synthetic and general reader, but also good for preachers, I think. Uh, some, some may know Brendan Burns uh, works on the sort of the, the three synoptics, which have titles which are not like commentary on Mark Matthew Luke, I forget, but they were published, I think, by the two press uh, and and they're accessible and uh, and and good ones for the preacher who sort of wants to go a, bit, a little bit straighter into or well, what does this mean for us so yeah I had a, um, a very mundane but um, all of all of that which has been said is fabulous um, and I need not add anything to it but just to encourage folks to practice the daily office well not practice but say the daily office um, in addition to all the commentaries that need to be read, particularly patristics and church fathers, because they had a certain, it seems like boldness, but they, they sort of uh, allow themselves to be consumed by the word and consumed by God, and sometimes be a little bit too timid. So reading them, I think, will help relax us in a way, but more so, well, not more so, but it, 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 the basic thing of doing the daily office sometimes allows the readings in the office, whether it be the Psalms, to uh, speak to the text that you, you're looking at for Sunday, and the readings speak one to each other. And there you sort of get a breadth and depth of how uh, uh, th there's a conversation going on, which you can then take to the prophet. You know. In addition to what others had said, I would say that um, I have found sermon uh, preaching groups really helpful, a little bit like what Christine was saying, but we actually have one with the Living Word. It's every other Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern, and we've been gathering. It's a rotating cast of characters, but this is based on something that my wife and I hosted in our home for six years when we were in upstate New York. And to just have people often from different denominational backgrounds um, who bring different approaches to the text, look at what, what stands out to them, and then uh, kind of what are those uh, homiletical paths? What are the ways that we can pull this together and relate to theme and things that are happening in the world. That's part of why I find reading old sermons so helpful, not because I'm trying to find lots of quotations I want to drop into my sermons, but because I want to see the ways that they connect text to uh, application or what other parts of scripture they see reflected here. And um, this has been a, a big part of this project with the living word is recognizing, as Andrew said, that there's this whole, we're not the first people to look at these texts, right? And we're not the first people to ask any difficult questions about these texts um, and to, to try to balance them in different ways um, and to, to draw on that um, and to, to give thanks for it and to see if it may lead us in places that are challenging or exciting um, that we would not have discovered otherwise. So going back and, and listening around. This is another part of why the living word has been valuable is every week we've got three sermons and I try to choose things that are really diverse. So not just which text they treat, but what kind of, we have sermons by evangelicals, we have sermons by Catholics and Anglo-Catholics and people who are more on the broad church side of things. And hopefully by hearing the word from each other, we can learn more fully how to live together in peace and how to work together and how to lift up those things that really are at the heart of our common commitment uh, in Christ's church. Thanks a lot. Now, Mark, let's back up just a tiny bit and, um, and give us a few more specifics. What is the living word? What is the living word in particular? An email? Yeah, so, so this is an email. It comes out every Monday, um, and uh, it'll have in it a series. Uh, we've been publishing in the Living Church for decades a kind of commentary each week on the text as a whole. So it'll have a couple of those, the most recent one, and then from a few years ago. And then it has three sermons um, written by contemporary preachers from all over the globe. We've 
pulled material from a couple hundred contributors and they're still in the process of receiving more. And then um, it'll have at least three classic texts that Cal has been gathering most of those for us. Um, and then it has articles on theological, moral, uh, pr practical themes that come up in the text. So it's kind of a thematically organized resource. And those are articles that have been published in our pages, on, in Covenant, in daily devotions over the years. And this has been a big curating project for us. We realized that mm. we have people who've written so much wonderful material. And for years, I've been clipping things from the Living Church and putting it in my sermon files. And this is a way of kind of helping others with that. And, you know, maybe you're a regular reader, but you, you hadn't thought of that article that you'd read for months. And hopefully, when you get the Living Word, it'll be there. So it's a, it, there's a free version, which is about five links. And then there's the premium version, which is like 20 links, 25 links, maybe more than you can read for a Sunday, but as a way of immersing yourself in some of these ideas and thoughts that costs $5 a month. But um, if you can't afford it and you can really still use it, I encourage you to let me know and I'll give you a free subscription for a year. Um, so we want this to be a resource that can be used by Anglicans and other Christians all over the world, sharing back these things that have been shared with us by our readers and writers um, across many decades. Right, right. And so then Cal, apparently it's not just contemporary material either. Tell us more about what you contribute. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess I'd, I'd begin by saying that um, the Christian church has a long history of uh, corporately helping, assisting its preachers. I mean, it's really remarkable how long what we're doing has been going on. This is not new. Uh, there, there have been collections of sermons that have been uh, published for the express purpose of assisting local clergy. That's been going on since, since the early Middle Ages, right? We think of the homilaries, right? Going all the way through the Reformation to the present day. And I'm, I'm struck, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm invigorated, uh, frankly, that we get to be a part of that ongoing project, that we can help pastors in their work. Um, so I, b before talking a little bit more about the sources themselves that, that I've been gathering, again, according to the RCL, um, I, would, I would simply note that um, most of those homilaries that I mentioned, most of those books of homilies, those, those postals that, that the church has often gathered through, through every generation, right? Very few of those, this is a sweeping general, generalization, very few of those did the authors ever expect you to go into your church, open up their book, and read a canned sermon, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a few instances in the 16th century where we really want to, the book of homilies was meant to control preaching to some extent, um, but the idea is that you can see this material as a pastor. You can read it. You can be inspired by it. You can draw bits and pieces out of it. And you know what? If none of it actually appears in your sermon, fine. But it was a help to you as you, uh, as Mark was saying earlier, were joining in the common project of engaging God's word, the common exegetical project, the common ascetical project too. You know, we've talked a lot about more intellectual commentaries, but there's also an ascetical dimension to this too, as well. Are we reading things like Introduction to the Devout Life? Are we reading uh, just the, the scores and scores of devotional material that have also been wrestling with the biblical text? And can we bring all of that together in an accessible way, right? That's where the editing part has had to be done, right? Uh, if you've ever sat down and tried to read, for example, just to name one, a Lancelot Andrews sermon, it can take a little time, right? So our goal is to make it accessible, right? Um, all in one place. So we've we've been basically crafting our own katina, right? Our, our own collection, sermon by sermon, Sunday by Sunday, uh, for all three years of the RCL, along with what, Mark, about, a, I think you and I haggled out, what, about 11 non-Sunday feast days as well. So, I mean, I, I am, I'm, I'm excited about this because, you know, as, you know, as a historian, 
and as a parish priest, it's one thing to teach a class and it's one thing to preach, but like, I feel like I'm getting to like help people, uh, not with my own words, but just to be able to say, hey, look at this, look what, not only what Augustine said about this same text, but here's what Luther said. Here's what um, Hildegard of Bingen said about this same text for this Sunday. And just think about it. You're joining with the great cloud of witnesses. Uh, and the diversity too, Mark mentioned. Uh, that's important. Now, granted, we stop, uh, uh, about, we stop about 1800. But now, granted, maybe this isn't much. I mean, I, I want to be careful about this. I don't want to claim diversity where there isn't one. Um, but if you do know the 19th century Church of England, to, uh, to, to put J.C. Ryle and John Henry Newman together on the same text. That, from, in an Anglican venue, that's a big deal, right? But, but I, I was so excited that I had a fantastic example of something from a Ryle sermon and a fantastic example from a Newman sermon, who both were brilliant preachers, you know, who, who, who were convicted in, their, in just their parish ministry, right? Uh, and to say, here are these two folks. Granted, both, I'm going to name it white, men in England, yes, I want to own that, that, that maybe that's not enough diversity, but at the same time, I want to say that these are two different poles in, within the capacity of Anglicanism, but here they are. You can join in that common project and bring it all for your people. Even if you don't quote them, they're there to help you get to the place you need to be as a pastor to preach God's word. So that I get excited about it. I'm sorry if I'm a little jittery, but I, I, I get excited about this project. It's a, it's a great, it's a great thing to, to have at your fingertips. Okay, let's go ahead and get to some of the questions that I've seen coming in. There've been some good ones. Um, now there are too many and, and uh, we won't be able to address them all, but, um, but I'll kind of address them by theme. Um, so given that a lot of people have been preaching uh, in new media lately, um, we have um, th this performative aspect, Cal, that you mentioned, the performative aspect of preaching has actually um, been probably quite altered uh, because people don't have that immediate engagement with, uh, with their uh, congregations. Um, so how does that change of context uh, affect uh, that. Another person, met a related question is um, content versus uh, form or style of presentation. Um, uh, you know, if maybe you're not that great at tech or um, even I think this questioner mentioned grammar, you know, some of the details of a polished presentation, um, how, how do those um, uh, balance each other out? Anybody want to respond to that? I think we can get wound up in how we perform. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't think about it, but I'm a person who spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, is my head right and are my hands right and how are my gestures mm. over the years? And I found that my preaching became more effective when in a way I just kind of trusted that to either fall in place or if it didn't fall into place for my people to love me enough to accept me as I am. And then just to try to inhabit mm. what I'm saying and think about how, how is God connecting with me through this and how is God allowing me to connect with my people through this? And if I can keep my mind on that connection, knowing that even though I'm looking at a screen, I'm I see Libby Willis is out there, who's one of my dear ones. Um, you know, if I can think I'm talking to her, um, I think it takes away the stress about, you know, am I talking quick enough? Is my grammar right? Is, are my consonants crisp? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add, um, uh, so, so in a sense, you have to forget about all the theatrics, as you just mentioned, you know. But what helps, I think, in forgetting the theatrics is that if you think that somehow God has um, opened your heart and eyes to the text and has allowed you to glean something from the text that is just uh, beyond, then, then you almost cannot wait. Uh, there is a sudden, I cannot wait to bear this good news to the people. Um, and you almost forget yourself, and it becomes a conversation of you telling them this good news that you've just received. Um, and it's about you 
well, telling the story and 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 um, and and sort of telling them what you think you've gleaned from God, and and for a moment there you might want to forget it allows you to forget yourself, you know, I think. I um, I, I would I would like to sort of encourage any preacher, seasoned or budding, listening to sort of think that first and foremost that what they're being called to in 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 the pulpit, literally or figuratively, is is authenticity. Uh, because I think that you know, good preaching is 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 a is a presentation of the the authentic self in relation to the to the Word of God. And um, uh, you know, if we can go back to uh, Michael Curry again for a moment, um, you, I would have to say that there are theatrics involved in Michael Curry's uh, preaching, but they're completely authentic, and that's why they work. Um, you know, and and uh, his example to us is the example that I want every young preacher to sort of th think about learning from Michael Curry is is that authenticity. Not all of them have either the persona or or, or the cultural reality in that would suggest that they should try and preach the way he does. Except that, of course, they all should be preaching the way he does, insofar as he is consistently Christ-centered and consistently authentic. You know, that that's that's the commonality I think. So just that kind of um, example again that you know Aquino Kino gave actually just sort of opening the self and, and one's own encounter with the word is is the thing that we're all called to but it's not going to look the same between any two preachers let alone any 27 let alone any 143 participants I see at this particular point I hope that what people see when they when they see either a Michael Curry or, or to take a Rowan Williams you know another great preacher of 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 the moment um or uh, any any others who come to mind is is not so much I want to do it that way as so much that they see the space between those models as permission giving and and occupying them into a, you know, inviting them into a, a generous self giving into the space that's provided by how diverse the reality of Anglican preaching can be uh, both just simply in terms of personalities let alone in terms of the broader um, cultural diversity to which I think we, you know, need to increasingly uh, pay more attention rather, rather than, for instance, to think that, that the job of the seminary or of the church more generally is to socialise people into preaching according to some pre-existing model. Rather, it should be about developing the authenticity of the preacher, not in no relationship to external models of possibilities, but in a way that will actually awaken their own deepest self, their, their own, the inner preacher, as it were. The word theatrics has been mentioned a couple of times, and uh, if I may be so bold with a, a background in theater to offer a comment that strikes me as quite relevant, that um, it would often be said, you can only rehearse for one thing at a time. What are you trying to accomplish in this rehearsal? You know, so, you know, translated to preaching, if you're standing there in the pulpit, you can't be thinking about, um, you know, changing your people's lives and your hand gestures and what the lighting looks like and all of these things, you might be able to rehearse those things at other times. And those are completely worthy things to think about, except then in the moment when you stand up, what's the, you know, the one thing necessary as Jesus might've said to Martha. So um, another great question um, has to do with, uh, a lot of people are preaching these days in a context in which they do not have the opportunity to celebrate the Eucharist. And so the preaching bears some extra weight, perhaps. Um, does this teach us anything about, um, about ministry and how would that uh, perhaps just would that change how we do anything, even in the post pandemic world, uh, so given that some people might even prefer to stay, uh, prefer to attend church? online. I think the core of that is the relative weight of preaching versus the Eucharist. Any comments on that? I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about this, Andrew, because I remember a piece you wrote for the Living Church a year or two where you claimed that American Episcopalians were still having morning prayer on Sundays. They just wore mm -hmm. Eucharistic vestments. So. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, may, may I say that I think I, I'm not yet ready to predict what exactly what we're going to have learned from the pandemic. But I, I've, you know, I have changed my mind about one or two things along the way, you know, since since the beginning um, as well. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, it was said earlier that we probably had to think about the significance of preaching in, a, in a, a new way. We've had to sort of take it more seriously because we haven't had whatever the other tools of the, the liturgy are, whether it's the, the pageantry, as it were, or the sacrament itself, which among another of my fears is that we tend to confuse those two things, as it were. Um, but um, I, I think it, it was interesting that part of the comment that Abigail read was that, uh, you know, some people might choose, you know, not to come back to church and, and may continue to watch sermons online or whatever, and, and, you know, for reasons of health and so forth. So those possibilities are absolutely to be understood. But let me, I, I want to say something at the risk of overstatement. Um, what we're doing online is not church. I don't mean to say it's bad. Um, at least it's it's only church in the same way that if I open my prayer book at 8 a.m. and I know there's a bunch of you over in Wisconsin doing so at 8 a.m. that we're being church to. Of course we are. Communion is not constrained by being in the same building. Communion is much bigger than that. Um, but people have legitimately inferred from that that the, the Zoom emulation of church is somehow church in a in a in a different mode. And I don't believe that's the case, except insofar as it's like us saying the office. In different places, you know what I mean. There is there is koinonia, there is communion, but there isn't church. So uh, one thing that it will, should tell us is that it is possible to preach and to hear preaching without church, just as it's been possible to read the Elizabethan homilies without church. And there are there are virtues. Uh, I, I I picked a bad example, Michael. You'd rather I picked um, you know, Caroline Divines, but I just thought I'd go to the other end of the of the extreme, you know, the other extreme. Um, the possibility of the word and, and of manifestations of preaching, going back to something Cal said a while ago, you know, the difference between the sermon and the, the text that represents it, that, that this should remind us that, that sermons have a life of their own, which is not constrained by the liturgy, as a matter of fact, but which can take flight in publication and in a whole variety of other ways. And now guess what? There's a bunch of sermons that are going to be on Zoom for as long as there are services to maintain um, these, these recordings. But that won't be church uh, in the sense that the sacraments are church, at least. Um, perhaps I should have said sacraments rather than church. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, I'm not trying to undercut the legitimacy or the, or the worthiness of people gathering online to pray together. Far from it, far from it. But I think one of the things that this should tell us is that um, the, the reality that is expressed in the physical sharing of bread and wine by a physically gathered community is not something that can be faked up. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are, aren't, aren't other good things, any particular things that are born by the spoken and written word that are not capable of being communicated by other means. So in fact, one of the things I hope we will have learned out of all this is that we don't have to lump worship into some sort of single bucket, uh, that the various things that we do by way of the faithful performance of prayer communally and individually, in person and not in person, are, are, are varied and rich and involve different possibilities. And the sacramental end of the spectrum is the one that actually happens when you're in the same room. And other possibilities, which are also capable of glorifying God and advancing the reign of God, can take place in other means as well. I would uh, like to think that the apostles spent a great deal of time speaking in odd places before they were able to so-called gather the church for, for communion and fellowship and the breaking of bread. And you know we want we may want to think that we are in a season of you know being evangelicals. You know we are talking a lot and preaching a lot and bringing forth the gospel, uh, sort of sort of gathering, but we've not yet arrived at the gathering site. You know, um, and this could just be that this this sort of season that we're in. Yeah, um, thank you all so much for your feedback to these questions. Other questions that people have raised. Um, that we're not going to really be able to give the time that they deserve include how do you make some certain decisions about the lectionary? Um, how do you decide when and how to address political issues? Do um, It seems as if a lot of people in the Episcopal Church will preach about poverty, but we don't find ourselves preaching to the poor. We don't think we're preaching to the poor. Um, so some uh, really great observations that lead to fantastic questions. Um, but I'd like to end um, by opening up to the panelists. What would you say to encourage uh, preachers who are with us today um, 
we've all been facing some extraordinary circumstances for quite a while. Um, so a lot of people may have been becoming disheartened. Um, what can you say as a word of encouragement as we close? I would just say that the word that God has given you to bring is such a gift to people, um, whether that is a word of comfort or a word of challenge, um, a, a ability to see the world right way up. Um, I just know that as I talk to friends who hear sermons all over the church, that um, a great deal of work has been done by the Holy Spirit in this time through the preaching that people have done. So carry on. It's, it's valuable. It's blessed. It brings, it advances the work of the gospel. I, my, my two cents would simply be, one, don't think that you have a whole lot to say. We tend to think, well, I got to say this. Like, and on the other hand, don't think that you have nothing to say, but rather think that God has everything to say. That's really important. Um, begin there. Um, 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 see the text as something to embrace in a struggle, no doubt, and, and know that God is in that struggle with you and start from there. I think about how much Jesus loves this church, how much Jesus loves your church, and how much Jesus loves you. And as we proclaim the risen Christ, you know, and his death and resurrection, our participation in his life, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting that we don't have the energy, the power to do. This is God's church and he will sustain it and he will sustain us. And well done, good and faithful servants. Um, I would say two snippets. One, my sermons have gotten much shorter these days and I think that's okay. Uh, uh, you know, just a few minutes and, and get right at it. Uh, the second thing I would say is have confidence in the kingdom that the text is pointing us to. So the, 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 the biblical text is pointing to an inbreaking kingdom. Have confidence in that kingdom and have confidence in that text that is pointing us to that inbreaking kingdom. Um, the very rich commentary in the last couple of minutes, I'd, I'd love to sort of replay some of, of those too. Um, I, I would like to sort of emphasize the need that the church and the world have for your your preaching voices, friends, whether you are uh, lay, deacon, priest, or, or bishop. Um, the, the need of the world is on show for us this past year and more mm -hmm. and in this past week. And the need that the world has may or may not be met most directly by your addressing those issues, it, and it may be, but it may be that the need of the world and the church is uh, is in your being a voice that reminds people that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, that may be a, a, as politically radical a thing as you have to say at the moment, but whether or not I'm right on that front, the world does need your voice. Uh, how will they hear if there is no messenger? So take courage from that, that charge. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned you might want to replay some of these words of encouragement. Well, um, this has been recorded and this conversation will be posted on the SEAT Network website. Um, uh, some of the resources we've mentioned uh, will also be listed there with the video recording. Um, for instance, how might you access the living word? Um, um, uh, some other resources that I, I see people have been asking for in the questions, for instance, Mark Michael, what Victorian um, sermons, you know, do you, do you want people to, to read and, and so on. Um, so uh, read we, Lytton sermons, you'll be fine with that. <laughs> perfect. So we will see if we can um, make sure that all those things are available with the video recording of this conversation on the SEEP website. Um, Thank you to the panelists for, for participating. Um, really wonderful insights, um, delightful conversation. And thank you all to the attendees for, um, for giving your time. And uh, hopefully this has been um, a, a good resource for you. All right, have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Bye. Thank you.
God bless. God bless you all.